Welcome to Mastermind Minutes, the podcast that focuses on the franchise industry. We'll cover topics that are important to franchisees as well as franchisors and share interesting insights that will help you build your business. We have one guest, we ask one question, and we do this in minutes, not hours. Hello again, and welcome to another edition of Mastermind Minutes. My name is Gary Grosso. I am the founder of Franchise Growth Solutions and the publisher of FranchiseMoneyMaker.com. We welcome you to the program. For those of you new and joining us perhaps for the first time, Mastermind Minutes is a unique podcast that focuses on franchising, franchisors, entrepreneurship, business, business development, coaching, anything to do with starting or running and improving a business. We, uh, we have one guest, we ask one question, and we get one expert answer. We usually do it in about 20, 25 minutes, so it's not something that you'll be tied to your to your pod, uh, your ear pods for uh, 45 minutes or an hour, and of course, you can always go back and, and listen to it again. And today, uh, I have the pleasure of speaking with uh, Herb Cogliano, who leads his own advisory practice, uh, leveraging the Scaling Up Performance Platform, and that's what we'll be calling, uh, that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, he is a business coach, uh, experienced uh, CEO. Uh, he is a practitioner of Scaling Up. He's a professor of the Scaling Up Master's uh, business course, and he's learned firsthand what it takes uh, really to overcome many business challenges, which I love because that's what we love to address on on this program. He was formerly the CEO of Sullivan and Cogliano Designers, a 53-year-old privately held family-owned technology staffing and workforce solutions firm. So I'm sure you know a lot about people and how they think. Uh, he uh, he was, uh, or that company actually was selected as one of the uh, fastest, 5,000 fastest growing uh, companies uh, uh, in, uh, I guess, in the United States or maybe in the world. I don't know. We'll talk about that. Uh, Herb, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, I'm really excited to talk with you again. We we have spoken in the past. Uh, I love what you do. Before we get into the question, why don't you tell the folks um, more about Scaling Up, about the book? I think the book is important and what you've been doing and what you're looking to do. Yeah, Gary, first of all, thank you. Great to be here with you and all your listeners of the Mastermind Minute. Um, I have been an entrepreneur, family business my entire life. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But during that journey, you can understand that you go through some ups and then some downs. And our business had been around for a while and we had gone through kind of a, um, a downturn and the business had plateaued. So you're working hard, you have very smart people, but nothing was changing. So somebody gave me the book, Scaling Up, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits in about 2000, late 2002. And it really became the operating manual for how you would organize and scale your company. And for those of you that have went to graduate school, you have an MBA, most of us small mid-market companies don't have access to a group of those type of people. We're on our own and we got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And the book was the first playbook that really organized our thinking around achieving different stages of growth. How do I become a $10 million company if I've only been a 5 million? How do I become a $50 million company if I've only been 20 million at my peak? And most of the owners get stuck, plateau, burn out, or end up exiting. And that book was a game changer. And that's why I'm here today, Gary. Tremendous, tremendous. So a couple of questions there before we get into our main question. So, so you applied that practice to the staffing company? We originally applied it to the education company right. at first. There was a smaller company. Right. We had maybe 25 employees. It'd been around a few years, but it was really struggling to get to the next level. Um, and we took a group in 30 months from 25 employees to over 100 in 50 employees, and we 10x our growth. 
Terrific. Terrific. Okay, great. So then, all right. So then we can move to our question because I, I really wanted to understand if that were, if we were talking about the company that Inc. Magazine named the one of the yeah. 5,000 fastest growing companies because my other question was, did did you get named fastest growing after you applied the practices or was it yes. before? And then you slip. Okay. So, yeah. so that that's key. That's key. So yes. your company, which had been around or your, your family's company and your, this, the 53 year old privately held company was around, was kind of slowing down. You applied this and bang, you became one of Inc's 5,000 fastest growing companies. Is that the right, the way it happened? Yeah. So we started with the education business almost like as a beta test, to be honest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that took off. We turned around the culture. The culture became a perennial best places to work in our current state and in other states that we ultimately opened in. We then became a three-time Inc. 5000 fastest growing firm in America out of 32 million companies in wow. America. And that's something I'm extremely proud of my team. Um, what it also told me, Gary, is that you could do well financially, but it also showed me you could do good by the people that work with you and the people that you serve. Mm -hmm. And I call that the double bottom line, purpose with profit. And that was a very gratifying way to build the company and to work with an amazing group of people to do it. Right. And I, and I love that. I, 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 I love that whole concept. And, and again, listen, that's like tremendous, tremendous validation of the method and the methodology uh, yes. that you just cited. Okay. So <clears throat> how does, you know, how does someone that has a thriving business, um, how do you how do you build that sort of a business that reflects their purpose and their values? You mentioned you had sort of a, a double bottom line. So how do you build that? Yeah, I think the first thing was awareness. Every company has a value has values and purpose, but most of them are not clarified and presented to the team. They're kind of like the unwritten values in the company, the way yep. people treat each other. Uh, it may be a little fragmented, but once you bring it out into the light and you get very clear about the values that you really covet and the purpose that you want to make the difference or the difference you want to make in the world, and you find like-minded people that share and aspire to deliver that, it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most people are just not that clear and focused on it. So that's so, step number one. So uh, let me just jump in. So so finding those people, finding like-minded people, let's just talk about that. Let's sort of peel that onion back a little bit because we've all worked with people who, I guess no matter what you do, they never get on board or they are, yeah. um, they just have... I don't want to, I'm not a psychologist. They have psychological issues or emotional issues where they either fly off the handle or they, uh, I don't know, passive regret, whatever. Okay. So you said you got to find people who are like-minded. Now I want to, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but you were in the, you were in the staffing business for 53 years. So I would imagine that your ability to sort of uh, sift through an individual and understand whether or not they would be a good fit would certainly be much greater than my ability to do it, let's say. So sure. when, you, when you talk about finding those people, what what are the things that you look for? I know you say like-minded, but how do you deter make those determinations? Um, if, and I'm going to keep it real simple, Gary. Okay, think that's of, good because I'm real simple. <laughs> yeah. I want you to give me one thing that you value greatly. Like what's a personal value for Gary? A personal value for me is working uh, on something, as you said, that is not only profitable, but has some level of human purpose and is a long view range. So I read uh, there's a proverb, I believe, and it describes sort of what's important to me. It's that uh, maybe somebody who's 60 or 70 years old that plants a tree 
knows that he or she will never sit under that shade, but they mm -hmm. nurture it nonetheless. Yeah. So a value could be purpose driven. It could be humanitarian focused, or it could be selfless, others above self. I would simply identify that value. And then I come up with interview questions. Gary, can you tell me about a time in your career where you were selfless and what, what happened at that time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I want to listen. And sometimes they're going to give me, how do I say the quote, pat answer. <laughs> and then I got a probe. So Gary, you said you were selfless when you shared your lunch with your fellow worker. Anything else? Like that's not too deep for me. Right, right. Not right. bad, but not deep. And, right. and I'll keep probing. And if you have only three to five really core values, mm -hmm. You can interview to screen in the people that you think hold them similar to you. Right, right. And, and I I love that. I, I love the fact that you said screen in instead of screen out. Correct. Just because somebody has different values doesn't make them a bad person. Mm -hmm, it just mm -hmm. doesn't make them the ideal fit for our culture with these values. Yep. Yep. Well, and that, that's the important piece. Yeah. And I think that's very important to keep in mind and actually to utilize the differences that people may bring to the table uh, for the overall movement of, of the company. So, all right. So the first step in scaling up is we've got to find like-minded people. We've got to plug them in. Uh, what else are we looking at uh, in terms of what do we need to do to scale that company up and keep its purpose and values connected with, say, the founder of the company? Well, we we had a purpose to help people find meaningful employment. Have you ever heard of a BHAG, Jim Collins, big, hairy, audacious goal, put a man on the moon type stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, Jim Collins is certainly somebody that I read uh, for sure and, and follow that a lot of his line of thinking. Uh, maybe you want to tell yeah. us a little bit more about that particular statement. Yeah. So if you think of your purpose, uh, helping people find meaningful employment, and you look at some big, let's say that I'm helping, um, I don't know, a thousand people a week find employment in my company. I'm having impact. I'm helping people with meaningful employment, but my impact is a thousand people. Mm -hmm. But what if I had a dream, me and my team, that over the next decade, I could help 10,000 people a week right. be okay. meaningfully employed. Mm -hmm. So that would, be our, that would be our big, hairy, audacious goal. And the BHAG is the number one strategic KPI that measures your in your purpose making a difference. So I want to 10x my purpose. And I want a group of people that get inspired and energized by scaling that purpose, impacting 10,000 versus 1,000 people a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, okay, so that certainly makes sense in terms of how it's connected to scaling up. But, and I say, but uh, not to challenge you, but just to explore a little bit more, sure. what are some of those, I mean, you know, one of, I guess one of the things that I, <clears throat> that I want to get at is um, what are the nuts and bolts? <laughs> how, how does it work? What is it that if someone wants to do that, what we know we got to get the right people in the boat. And as Jim Collins says that not only the right people on the bus, as he says, but they got to be sitting in the right seat. I get that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But how do we do it? What's the steps? How do we get those people in? How do we get them motivated? How do we get them on board? Um, is it just talking? Is it, uh, you know, I've heard a lot about the gamification of training, uh, of team building, things of this nature. What are some of those internal assets that you use? Okay. Well, this is Mastermind Minute. 
this okay. this that question well, I could I could take a mastermind hour. Okay, fair, fair enough. We'd have to have you come back for that. Yes. Uh, actually, yes. we do. Uh, uh, my company, Franchise Growth Solutions. We probably could have you on that. We do a series of what we call franchise or master sessions, which are one hour long seminars on a topic. Uh, we we should probably have you come on that <laughs> and talk about this. Sure. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I I get it. So you know, in in terms of scaling up, um, some of the other things that we should be focused on. What are, what are some of the other things we should be looking at? Well, obviously, people, as you mentioned, yeah. some of the other yeah. aspects. I I think the second thing that I see is strategy, and I boil it down to keep things very simple. Do you have an offering that a core client will value and is differentiated from your competition in the market? Because what I see business owners do is they have a product or offering that other people value, but it's not really different from the competition. So you will ultimately be commoditized. And although you're a hard worker and you're smart, you'll win if you work hard enough a share of the market, but it will be a grind. And the more competition comes in and evolves, the harder and harder it gets to win your incremental share of the market and your pricing and your margins will all start to drop over time. And unfortunately, your expenses will continue to increase. Yep. So the real difference maker in a great strategy is the value, which is distinctive from your competitor. And that takes work, Gary. Yeah, well, okay. So I'm going to clip this out and maybe send it to uh, our either new clients, existing clients, or people who want to be our clients, uh, because one of the things that we talk about, uh, obviously, when you're franchising, which is sort of my game here, and we and we we focus on restaurants. Okay, so focusing on restaurant franchising is unique in the sense that everyone is doing it. Okay, <laughs> there's yeah. restaurants everywhere. So one of the questions we ask our clients before they become clients is, talk to me about your brand talk to me about the points of difference the points of differentiation and you can't tell me about the food mm. and they're generally dumbfounded because their 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 mindset is that their product is what they're offering and what we sure. talk about is no it's the experience that you're offering what do people remember about how do they feel when they leave your restaurant not how good was the veal cutlet or whatever it is you're serving or the hamburger okay so that is a huge bridge to cross for a lot of people we we refer to them as the distinct competitive advantages because again in the restaurant business ask any restaurant tour if they're not selling fresh food of course, they're selling fresh food or if they don't have good food, of course. And it's all, you know, it's grandma's recipe. And OK, <laughs> all right. What makes you different from 40 other guys on the, in the same town? That's the key. Sure. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. I would tell you my I would tell you you're preaching to the choir on that one. Um, so strategy strategy would be number two. So we got people. We got strategy. Where yeah. do we go from there? Um, execution. You can have a great strategy, but boy, if you can't deliver on scale, you can have one good client experience, but could you have a thousand in a row? You All at that high level of executed delivery and results. And that doesn't always happen. No. And by the way, the more yeah. people you hire, the more offerings you roll out, the more locations you open, the more clients you bring on, the complexity of communicating and decision-making becomes exponentially harder. So execution goes down because the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. Your systems are not integrated. Your people, communication, collaboration, decision making is not truly integrated. And you spend a lot of money, work a lot of hours, 
with a little to show for it at the end of the day. Uh, I'm telling you, maybe we were separated at birth here because I, I had <laughs> this little this little speech that I do sometimes at public speaking, and I think I did a short reel on it. And uh, it's about this concept that knowledge is power. And my and my re my reply always is the the idea that knowledge in and of itself is power is bullshit. Okay, it's the execution of knowledge that's power. Uh, you yes. can be the smartest person in the world, but if you sit there like a lump on a log, nothing's going to happen. And you're correct. If the systems, and I've learned this from from Fred Fred Curvan, a guy I work with, he's he's our partner in this. He he's a systems guy. So as the business grows, the systems have to constantly evolve and and yes. be able to monitor and measure a result, and then kind of kick it up to the next level. And that is, I for someone like me, that is, I don't want to say near impossible. I'm sure if I put my head to it, I could do it, but. It's inconsistent with my DNA. My DNA is, hey, I'm the sales guy. I'm creative. I'm the artist. I'm doing this. I'm the talking head. Don't don't sit me in front of Excel sheets because I go nuts. But, but, it's just as important. It's yes. just as important. And 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 if you're going to scale up, having those systems and going back and looking at them and reinventing them, and I think that's very key. So we got we got people strategy sort of the systems where else are we looking is, is there yeah. more there's got to be more i'm sure <laughs> yeah well um execution was third the final yeah, one execution, is cash. i'm sorry yes is what i'm sorry uh the final one is cash cash okay do you have enough cash to self-fund your growth most people in the beginning think do i have enough cash to make payroll and keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. But what I'm talking about is opportunity cash. That competitor that you've been looking to buy for the last three years is finally willing to sell, but you don't have enough funding to afford it. That key executive you always want to add to your management team is available, but you can't afford to hire or pay them. So how do you have a business with high enough margins, strong enough cash flow to self-fund the rate of growth to support your scaling up goals. Brilliant, brilliant. And that is an issue that is big and weighs on the hearts and minds of most entrepreneurs and even experienced CEOs who are taking companies higher and higher and higher. Yeah. So- so I, I, I would say that, you know, the simple question is, so what's the solution? So, uh, you know, if they can't self-fund, um, are we talking about equity infusion? Are we talking about debt instruments? What are some of the things that you you would say could help someone get there? Because it would really, really be, uh, you know, probably not the best thing that if, as you said, you wanted to buy that company and then you can't because you don't have the cash. So how do we solve yeah. that problem? Well, I think there's a short and a long-term solution. I think the short-term solution is you look at all those available type of family and friends, traditional banking, private equity, all those things. However, the long-term solution is to position yourself in markets that you can get those type of margins and returns. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. I was speaking to a gentleman. He was one of my students and he was in a commodities business. Um, they sold like plastic. But I think the net bottom line, Gary, was under 2% profit, Ooh. Which, is, which is not good. Not good. He did a lot of volume, but under 2%. So we talked about the concept during class and he said to me, you know what? I've come up with a new offering. I'm so excited. And when I looked at the offering, I said, so tell me, what are the new operating profits? He goes, I can't believe it, 8%. Wow. And I said, well, that's great progress. But I said, as an entrepreneur, 
you have the power to go into any market that you can understand and deliver value. Why not pick a market if you can that would give you a 20, 30, or 40% return, like a, like a Microsoft or a software company? Um, you're only limited by your mindset and what you're capable of doing as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So it was a light bulb moment for him because he was so used to 2%, 8% 8 profit was such like a big deal where we're looking at our clients having minimum of 15 to 20 plus percent profit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a mindset that takes time. But when you have that type of profit level, you have a higher probability of self-funding. Yeah. Which yeah. is what so, we want. Yeah. Whenever so possible. I'm sorry. We definitely have to have you back on. I mean, there is so many layers to this. So let me just recap and see if I get it all right now. Okay. So we're talking about people, having the right people, the right strategy, proper and total execution on the strategy, and cash to fulfill the plan. You got it. Okay. Well, yeah, we definitely have to have you back. But for now, is there any last thought you can get, leave with us and uh, uh, share with the audience on this topic? Yeah, I, I believe every business owner should create the company to support their dreams. I've seen so many people go into business where the dream turns into a nightmare. And I, my purpose is helping people unleash their potential so that they can actually have a dream and bring that to life. And I want you to have a business where you can be happy, where it can have impact, and you can work with a group of, you know, wonderful, like-minded people and make a difference in the world. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, yeah, it's not just about starting a business that ultimately becomes, you know, your job and you have maybe maybe you have more money, but you don't have more time and you right. become slave to that. So um, if someone wanted to reach out to you and learn more about this, either speak with you directly, someone on your staff, however mm -hmm. it works, what do we do? How do we get in touch with you? Yeah, simply go to Aspire Growth Advisors with an S dot com. We have a complimentary assessment for anybody that wants to check their business scaling up readiness. We have a quick assessment. And for any owner CEO that wants to check their high impact CEO readiness, feel free to take that as well. Well, that's great. Folks, we've been speaking with Herb Cogliano, who apparently has this purpose and this mission to help people scale their business up and be happy in owning their business. And I'm glad that that's your mission and your purpose. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for being with us today and spending the last 20 minutes or so. We definitely have to have you back because there's so much more to this because you mentioned something that you only mentioned the word, but I have a whole lot of stuff about it. And that's mindset, which to me above that is belief system, which I think really plays into the success of an entrepreneur. So we have to have you back. But for now, thank you so much for being with us today. I truly, truly appreciate it. It has been my pleasure. And I would love to come back when whenever you think it'd be appropriate. And thank you to you and your audience as well. I wish you all continued success. Great. Thank you very much, Herb.